Okay, we're here with uh, research in Manoa. The 12 o'clock, oops, make that the 1 o'clock rock uh, on um, every, every Monday. We're here with uh, Richard Hay today, H-E-Y, and he is a professor and researcher at the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology at UH Manoa. That's so west, if you didn't know. Okay, and uh, welcome to the show, Richard. Nice to have you here. Thanks, Jay. Nice to be here. Yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, we are always delighted and amazed to find guys like you at HIGP and at SOAS doing the fabulous things you do because we recognize that it's not local, it's not even national, it's not even global, it's, it's the whole enchilada, <laughs> it's the world, the universe, that's what you do. This is something. That's, we, we try to contribute. And your special brand, your special sauce is doing uh, seafloors near Iceland. Um, and that means nascent rifting, because you want to find out about nascent rifting, and we're going to get you to define what nascent rifting is in a minute. Okay. How did you get into this? Uh, basically, I've been very lucky. Uh, I, was, I was a Sputnik kid. I was in fourth grade when Sputnik was launched, and there was sort of an understanding that we needed scientists in this country so we could fight the Russians. And so I, I feel like I've been on a science track for quite a while. And I went to college hoping to become a great mathematician, and it was quickly apparent that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> Why? Uh, Did I, you not like math? No, no, I, I love math. I, I mean, in high school, I was, I was very good at it. But I, got, I went to Caltech for college, and I got there, and there were a lot of students that were better at math yeah. than isn't, I was. Isn't that what happens? You, <laughs> you, 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 know, you get out of high school, and you think you know some stuff, and you get to college, and my God, these guys are so smart. What can you do? Well, what I did was change majors because I just wasn't uh, doing that well in a required math class. And mm -hmm. I was taking intro geology, and I was loving the field trips. We got to go hiking around the San Gabriel Mountains. Yeah. It was wonderful. And so I, I ended up majoring in geology. Yeah. And then on one field trip, I asked the professor leading the field trip uh, whether every landform was due to tectonics, because we were on the San Andreas Fault, and, and in California, pretty much every landform is tectonics. If you have a friend living on a hill in California, it, that hill is there because of earthquakes. When you say tectonics, you mean the shifting of the plates? Yeah, yeah tectonics is the study of the, uh, how, how uh, landforms on Earth arose and the forces that, that produced them. Yeah. So he kind of chuckled and said I should leave California for grad school and go to, uh, he, he encouraged me to go to Princeton so I'd learn that tectonics didn't explain everything. <laughs> and I learned the opposite because I got to Princeton just after a young postdoc there, Jason Morgan, yeah. discovered plate tectonics and uh, I was lucky enough to become his first plate tectonics grad student. What year was that? That was 1969. And that was the discovery that plate tectonics was under underlying all of it. Okay. He discovered plate tectonics in 67 and then in 69 published the last of the truly revolutionary papers and I got there and he had just organized an oceanographic expedition with another professor and they were uh, going to the Galapagos Triple Junction which of course, is three, three plates uh, come together. They, they meet at... at, at uh, near Galapagos. Near the Galapagos Islands. Yeah. And there were uh, tests of plate tectonics. Tests of the hypothesis were possible there. And the grad student that was supposed to go suddenly couldn't because of Vietnam. And I happened to be walking down the hall just when they discovered they needed a new grad student. And so they jumped out and grabbed me and said, how would you like to be an oceanographer? Funny thing is, those are the moments you remember your whole life. That, Just that place in the hall, yeah, walking down the hall. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Ken DeFace was the guy that jumped out. Jason is, uh, is more low-key, but uh, he, he was the, the, the brains behind I the I knew operation. you'd remember all the names. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, I mean, that's if you want high school kids, a lesson for high school kids to yeah, learn, yeah. be very lucky, be in the right place at the right time. Yeah, and, and know you're there. You're going to recognize the opportunity when it pops up. Well, it sounded good, you know, being an oceanographer. I didn't have a project of my own, and all of a sudden, I mean, this seemed like a golden opportunity. Turned out I love going to sea, and mm -hmm. so I ended up becoming an oceanographer. How, how was it, the trip to Galapagos? How was it? Uh, it, was, it was wonderful. I was seasick the first couple of days, <laughs> but, you know, like most people, you get your sea legs yeah, after you the first two or three days. Yeah. 
Yeah. And what did you discover there? You discovered that his theory was right? Yes. Uh, we could test the rigid plate hypothesis that, that said if you know the motion of plate A relative to plate B and plate B relative to plate C, you can predict the motion of plate C relative to plate A if the plates are rigid. And it turns out the plates are pretty rigid, certainly good enough that plate tectonics works very well. Geophysics. Geophysics. A really so important thing in geophysics. So I ended up in geophysics. I, I had tried that at Caltech and it didn't work out too well because you had to take all the courses the geology majors had to take and you had to take all the courses the physics majors had to take and it was it was pretty tough. Yeah, yeah. But at Princeton it was easier. So, uh, so uh, I just want to put myself in your shoes when you get back from Galapagos. Yeah. You're all stirred up about uh, you know the trip, and the, and the plate theory. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know you you you've had you've had contact with the the field of oceanography. Uh, what happens? What do you do? How do you firm up your plan? Well, then we had data, and the data had to be analyzed. And the professor that was the chief scientist. Ken DeFace was just extraordinarily generous. I mean, it was the first triple junction expedition, and he turned the data and the analysis over to me. And when I did it, he turned the publication over to me. He allowed me to be first author on the on the publication. Not every professor would yeah. have done that. Well, let's let's just uh, hold on that for a minute. You know that <clears throat> that's true in, in academia and in science. There are a lot of researchers who don't turn it over, mm -hmm. who hold on to it themselves, they want their name on it, and you're their assistant, but you're not their partner. Mm -hmm. And certainly they're not going to help you in advancing your career individually. Um, but there are some others who are generous, as I think the term you used. That's right. And he gave you the data, he gave you the opportunity, he gave you the, you know, the publication of it, and this is a springboard for you. Mm -hmm. um, this, is a, this is a leader man, this is a leading <clears throat> a leadership scientist, I would say. Yeah? I've tried to do the same for my grad students through the years. Yeah. So that's very important to advance science in the world, to have mm -hmm. people around like you, like him, uh, who are willing to, uh, you know, part with the publication rights. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> and help you at the same time. That's right. <laughs> so he would be a mentor to you. Exactly. And also give you the opportunity to advance your career with it. Th that's right. Jason was, was more of the mentor because he, like I say, he was the, the brains behind all, all of plate tectonics. So I ended up working with him. Mm -hmm. And in analyzing the data, there was a problem that, uh, the hot, you know, the hot spot hypothesis. Hawaii is a hot spot, and as the plate moves over, an island forms, and then that island gets taken away, and another one coming from deep in the mantle comes up, and that one gets rafted away, and then there's always a big active island at the end of this chain of, uh, of old islands that slowly sink as the seafloor sinks. And in Galapagos, there was a problem. There seemed to be geometric reasons why that hypothesis couldn't work. So it used to be really controversial that almost nobody believed in hot spots. Jason did, and his, his intuition about the Earth was just incredible. And so he, he, the problem he set me on was try to figure out what we don't understand about plate tectonics that would allow Galapagos to be a hot spot. And it turned out the, the, the solution was there are small shifts of the mid-ocean ridge that uh, the, the seafloor spreading center, the mid-ocean ridge, sometimes will, will shift positions. It jumps, ridge jumps are what we call them. And those ridge jumps were the, were the key. They allowed Galapagos to be a hot spot and uh, also uh, uh, said that if, if it was fixed with respect to Hawaii, there should be aseismic ridges coming off of it with angles just like the Cocos and Carnegie seismic ridges coming away from Galapagos. So the common denominator between the two places, the processes in both places. That's right. Same process in both places. So I came, I finished my PhD, came to Hawaii to give a recruiting talk, and I said, good news, Galapagos can be a hot spot just like Hawaii. And the entire <laughs> faculty here rose up enthusiastically and said, Hawaii's not a hot spot because nobody here believed Hawaii was a hot spot. We all did at Princeton. And that's why they needed to have you here, Richard. <laughs> so they hired me, and I've been here ever since, except for six years at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Oh, that's, not a bad, that's not a bad hiatus. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's let's talk about uh, where you went from there. So you get here on the hot spot discussion, right? Um, and you get into HIGP. I guess that's where it started. That's right. And what year was that? I first came to HIGP in 1975, and then... You know, that's over 40 years ago, yeah. 
It's I'm been sorry, a long I'm sorry time. I said that. I yeah. didn't ask whether you remembered <laughs> Sputnik. <laughs> I did. <laughs> so, okay, so can you, can you <clears throat> connect the dots from there to the time now when you're making these uh, regular trips to the seafloor near Iceland and learning about nascent rifting? It turns out those Galapagos ridge jumps occurred in very systematic patterns. Each one was younger and longer than the preceding jump. And in working out what that implied, this, this is all data, in working out what the data implied, it meant that one mid-ocean ridge was breaking through a plate, replacing another one. So this is one we call the propagating rift, and this one we call the, it's a dying rift. We call it the failed rift, gets left behind on one of the ridge is, flanks. Is a rift a ridge? A rift and ridge are the same, same thing. Same okay, thing. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, and Aloha, this namaskar, process and on a larger scale my name is produces microplates when both of these, the when, instead of, Climate in the simple propagating rift outrage. model, this one grows, propagates, this one dies, and there's only one active at any given time. But when the scale gets large enough, this one doesn't turn off at exactly the same time this one propagates. So for a while, you've got these two ridges that are active. Contending. And, that's right. And this is what's going on near Easter Island, where I've done a lot of work. Uh, you, I don't know if that graphic is up or not. Yeah, let's put the graphic up. <coughs> I have the graphic, and okay. we can explain. And I, I, don't, I don't know how to. <coughs> okay, there's there's the graphic. Huh? Uh, okay. Like near near Easter Island. I don't know how to point. But we you we see, don't have a way to point. You have to describe it. Okay. Uh, there are places where the, where the mid-ocean ridge, it looks like there's a little circle in a couple of places near the left middle of the map, near Easter Island, if, if your readers know where it is, south of the Galapagos. Mm -hmm. and those I are, see two circles. There. That's right. One of those is the Easter microplate, one's the Juan Fernandez microplate. Okay. And this is what's going on. This is when rift propagation gets a very big scale. What are those lines? The lines that are mostly north-south are the mid-ocean ridges. The one between South America and Africa would be the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and it goes from the southern tip of Africa and South America all the way up to where it hits Iceland, bringing you back to why I'm talking about Iceland. Yeah. In Iceland, there are propagating rifts and there are microplates that are uh, causing Iceland to evolve the way it does. How big are these structures? I mean, is this... If I went along that line, what would I see at the ocean floor? What would it look like? Depends. If you're on the East Pacific Rise, mm -hmm. uh, near, near those microplates, you wouldn't even know you were on a mountain system. You'd be on the biggest mountain system on Earth, <laughs> and, and it's so gentle, you wouldn't know that it was there. It's, it's like one part in a, in a thousand a, a slope. Now, there's some areas that are a lot rougher. There's faults on the seafloor sea and scarps and volcanic eruptive sites and fissures. So on a local scale, it's pretty rough. But on the large scale, this is just a, a very shallow it's kind sort of like of Mauna slope. Loa, because when you're on Mauna Loa, the thing is so big. That's right. The base of the mountain is so big that you, you can't even see the, the slope of it. That's right. Same, same thing. So um, it doesn't matter how deep uh, the, uh, the rift is, right? I mean, it could be very deep or it could be not so deep. You still get the same kind of uh, experience, the same kind of shape and structure. Until it goes subaerial. What and does goes, that mean? Uh, 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 you can walk around on land. And there's two places on Earth you can walk on a mid-ocean ridge. One is Iceland and one is the Afar Triangle. Where is that? Uh, it's where the Gulf of Aden, there's rifting in the Gulf of Aden. Uh, well, let's get the map back. Okay. <clears throat> and you can try to describe it. Okay. If you look at, look at Africa, the northeast corner of Africa, there's the Red Sea between Africa and Arabia, mm -hmm. and there's a mid-ocean ridge that goes down the Red Sea. You come down, and it looks like there's a bend that goes out into the Indian Ocean. That's, yes. that's the Gulf of Aden. There's yes. another uh, ridge there. Yes. And then East Africa. I don't know if you've ever been to East Africa. No. It's, uh, it's breaking apart right now, and we don't know if it'll be successful or not. It's been doing this for about 30 million years, and so far all there are are rift valleys and big lakes. Uh, but right there is another triple junction where the three plates meet, and right in that area, it's also propagating rifts and microplates. It's the other area on Earth you can walk around. shallow. Shallow, so that's mean, right. We're talking about it's at sea level or maybe uh, it's above, above sea level? Yeah, yeah. You can, how, how far above? Uh, well, Iceland, the mountains get up to, uh, 
I don't know exactly, but I'm guessing a, a kilometer or so. Oh, that's amazing. That's, a that's a high mountain, but yeah, it's not yeah. a mountain. It's a seafloor. It's seafloor spreading, but it's also over a hot spot, and so you get excess volcanism that's coming up. So, you, so it's unusually shallow. Is why you can walk around on it. And, and the same, the same in Aden. The same. Yes. Looks the same. You can. It's also a mountain. You can walk on it. It's it's actually a depression there. The Afar depression because the the Aden is trying to break in. The Red Sea is trying to propagate south. And in that area, it's, it ends up being a depression, although the East African rifts get, get pretty high. I mean, if you're up in the mountains there, you're a kilometer or two up. So this is, the, these rifts are within Iceland, within the, the, the shoreline of, of Iceland, or they, uh -huh. they're not out at sea or anything? Well, it, you, can, you can go out at sea, and you can sail right along the ridge axis and go all the way up, and it hits the coast of Iceland, and then you'd have to get out, out of your boat and, and start walking. But there are places on Iceland if your legs were long enough, you could have one leg on the North American plate and one leg on the Eurasian plate, and they spread apart. Now you don't want to stand there any, any longer than 10 million years. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's right. That would be very unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to take a short break now. This is Richard Hay. Uh, he's with the Hawaii Institute of Geophysical Planetology. He's a professor and researcher there at SOWEST. We're looking at nascent rifting. We'll be right back. Aloha, this is Maria Mera, and I'm here to invite you to my bilingual show, Viva Hawaii on Think Tech Hawaii, every other Monday at 3 p.m. We're here to inform, motivate, and entertain you. Join us. Hola, soy Maria Mera, y estoy aquí para invitaros a mi show bilingüe, Viva Hawaii en Think Tech Hawaii, cada dos lunes a las 3 de la tarde. Estamos aquí para informaros, motivaros y entreteneros. Apuntaros. Hi. I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on Think Tech. This show is so very dear to my heart. We talk with artists of various different ilk here about the process that they go through for their art. So we talk about what they're doing, why they're doing it, how they do it. And it's a show that is inspiring. This is what I hear from people all the time. And a show that will teach you something, sometimes something about yourself. I hope you'll join us. The show is Center Stage. It's on Think Tech every Wednesday at 2 o'clock. We'll see you then. We're back. We're live. We're here with Richard Hay. Uh, and he is a researcher and professor at uh, HIGP at SOAS, the School of Ocean Earth Science and Technology at UH Manoa. We're talking about nascent rifting which we are learning a lot about. It's very interesting. And Richard, you know, it's perfectly understandable. I really appreciate that you're putting it in, uh, you know, layman's terms. Um, although uh, I'd like to know what nascent means. Nascent, just being born. So the, the new rift as it propagates, there, it, the plate is breaking apart. So there's no rifting at all here. The rift propagates in, the plate starts to rift apart. And after it rifts long enough, then a new mid-ocean ridge forms. It takes a while to go from the rifting to the seafloor spreading. So sometimes I'll say rift and sometimes ridge. Is this a violent kind of uh, opposition? Uh, is it like a volcanic uh, opposition or is it just ever so slowly sliding? Uh, they're just slowly breaking apart. There are earthquakes right at the tip, but they're not the huge earthquakes. There's yeah. nothing that's going to cause uh, damage to people living here. So what is really interesting to you and any geophysicist about this is that you get a chance to see a rift well, with your own eyes over the sea level. Otherwise, you'd have to go down in the ocean and see it below the sea level. That's right. So this gives you an observation platform you would never otherwise have. That's right. And so that's why we need to use remote sensing, because light doesn't travel very far through seawater. When you're down, I, I go to the bottom of the ocean sometimes in a research submersible, Alvin, mm -hmm. and you look out the porthole and you see about 10 meters. So it's hard to get the large-scale view of what's going on. Yeah, and you're looking at large-scale things. Th that's right. So 10 meters is not helping you much. That's right. Yeah. How large is the large scale? I mean, if I, if I wanted to see enough to really make me understand what's going on, how far would I have to see? How, how large are these structures in miles? Uh, it, when, we're, when you're walking around on Iceland, it's sort of like walking on Mauna Kea. You can see places where there's a, a, a scarp, a, a fault scarp on one side and a fault scarp on the other, and you can walk down there and you can look maybe uh, 20 meters from one side to the other and you know, okay, that's, that's North America and that's Eurasia and gradually 20 millimeters per year, 20 kilometers in a million years. 
they, they move apart. But it's hard getting the overall view. Uh, the, the best way to do it is to rent a, a small plane and fly over these things Pictures. so you can get... Uh, What's a scarp? Uh, a fault, like the edge of this table, this would be a, a scarp. If this used to be against the wall and the table spread away from the wall, this would be a fault scarp. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so you're there. How do you get to the, uh, by the way, how do you get to the rift uh, off Iceland? How do you get there? You take a boat or a plane? Or? Well, I'm an oceanographer, and yeah. so I You I don't mind going to remote places. Oh, that's one of the, <laughs> one of the uh, it used to be one of the advantages. When I got into this field, it was a lot different. Now I have a wife and a son, and travel's not as appealing as it used to be. Yeah, maybe your son will be a, a, a geologist also. Possibly. <laughs> oceanographer. Possibly. So uh, most of my expeditions, I need a, a ship and I need remote sensing equipment to, to see through the water. There's four types of ocean, you probably know this already, but there's the, the, some oceanographers study the water, how it moves around. Some study the biology that lives in the water. Dave Curl. Yeah, Dave is a good friend. He's a great example of that. And then uh, some study the chemistry of the water. Mm -hmm. I study the seafloor, so to me, the water is in the way. So I, I need <laughs> ways to see through the, the, the water, yeah. and that's what we use uh, our remote sensing tools for. Okay. <clears throat> so, by the way, how, how do you get a ship if you're a scientist? You write a you, proposal. You call to them the, up on the yeah, phone and say, yeah. you send a ship. Oh, I wish. I an wish. Uber ship. Yeah. I wish you were running the National <laughs> Science Foundation and we could do it that way. And, no, you write a proposal, and if you're very lucky, it gets funded the first time. Mm -hmm. Usually it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And after a while, you, you beat at them long enough, and eventually they give up and, and fund your ship. But they're expensive. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, a month of sea time, which is typically what we go out for, is roughly a million dollars just just for the ship before you actually start doing stuff. Then you have the staffing and the and the uh, navigational crew and all that. That's right. This is a project. Yeah. And to say nothing of all the instruments and uh, you know data gathering equipment you need to have. That's right. A million dollars for a month. Why? I, maybe I should go into that business. Fuel is expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe I will go into that business. <laughs> well, they, I mean, they're not, they're not making money. I mean, they're, they charge what it costs them to run. So, yeah. so the money comes into the economy, but, but still nobody's getting rich in this field. Okay, so now um, you, you need remote sensing equipment. Yeah. What is that? Well, I want to see the seafloor. So the, the biggest piece of remote sensing equipment I use is called multi-beam sonar. In the old days, when I started, my first expedition was in 1970, the Galapagos expedition, and it used to be you'd sail along in your ship and you'd send an acoustic pulse down and you'd measure how long it took the sound to bounce off the seafloor and come back. We know the speed of sound in seawater so we can calculate the depth of the seafloor. But all of this sort of assumes the seafloor is fairly flat. If the seafloor looks like this and you're trying to measure the depth under the ship, that this acoustic pulse goes out, first thing it sees is over here, that return comes back and you think the, sea, the, the depth of the seafloor is like this. In fact, it's like this. So that's a problem. So some very talented engineers figured out that if they made multiple beams, now we're, we use 180 of these beams. 180 and they, beams, wow. And they can be focused and so they, they go out to the side and these are focused and they measure the returns that come back and then with some very uh, advanced computer processing, we can create a map of the seafloor in this wide swath. It's a topographical map. Topographic map. map. If you were going hiking, you could use the maps we create of the seafloor and we yeah. make them in real time and at the depths I work, yeah. It's about, I work in two or three kilometers of water, typically a couple of miles, yeah. that the swath that we measure is about 10 kilometers. So in real time, we're getting a 10 kilometer wide topo map of the seafloor. What, what do you mean real time? Uh, a know. minute, a minute or so time lagged for the, for the sound to come out, come back, get processed by the computer. And you see it right there. Mm -hmm. And then, it, of course, the computer is going to remember all that data yeah. and give you a, a topographical map of the whole area that you've covered. That, that's right. And a lot of the times we'll uh, do what's called a mosaic, where we'll do a 10-kilometer swath, come up, do another one that overlaps slightly, up another one overlaps slightly. Stitch it together. Yeah. So then you get an accurate map. It's actually made more accurate if you have overlap, because then the overlap can verify 
that, you know, the two pieces that are being overlapped. Exactly, yeah. and we've done tests on these things, and they're remarkable. You do one ship track like that, and another one like this, and every contour overlays the other one perfectly. It's, it's just software. It revolutionized the field. Where does the software come from? Uh, gee, that's you, you don't write it, though. I, I don't write Somebody's, it. No. Somebody, somebody. These engineers have uh, have written it, and okay. then I just use their equipment. It's like it's like the stitch uh, software in the, in the cameras. That's what it is. You know, taking a piece. And then finding out where the edge is, and then yeah. putting them together. You know, that that's really uh, so. Okay, so you have the data that gives you the topographical map. Mm -hmm. Now you have the map, and I guess that map is about as good as it gets because that map's going to tell you, you know, the exact elevation of every little point. How close are the points on the map that you get? Uh, Gee, the, every little pixel, it's broken into pixels, and a typical pixel might be about a, a hundred meters square, something like that, oh. so you get a depth every hundred meters. That's, that's a pretty big distance. Uh, well, it's, we're, we're talking then, about large. Very then large. we're standing back quite a ways and looking at it, and yeah, so yeah. It, it's, uh, it's pretty so nice. So now you map. have this map, and now the geology begins. <laughs> the geology, we, we use, uh, you can get you can use the multi-beam sonar to do the geology, but when we do the geology, we typically want to take a closer look at what's going on. So instead of having this 10 kilometer wide swath that we use with multi-beam, we, we use uh, TOAD systems. So T-O-A-D? TOAD, T-O-W-E-D. Oh, you, you tow it be, oh, behind okay. the ship. You okay. tow it at a much lower speed and you use higher frequency. So you get maybe a one kilometer swath. And we measure the uh, uh, the uh, acoustic return, the amplitude of the return. So not just the time that it takes, but how strong the return is. What does that tell you? Well, in, uh, on a mid-ocean ridge, the, at the ridge, it's young, unsedimented basalt. It's just been formed, zero oh. age, basically. And so that's hard rock, so you get a lot of sound back. But as the seafloor spreads away, that sediment, everything, the, the biology that Dave Carl works on is uh, dying all the time, and so it's coming down like snow. In the Galapagos area, it's, you're in a snowstorm when you're, when you're down on the seafloor. And so away from the ridge, there's a little sediment, and then a little more, and then a little more. And so once you get enough sediment, that starts absorbing some of the sound, so you don't get as strong a return back. But you can tell the nature of the bottom. That's you right. Can tell the, the the kind of material that's down there. That's right. Uh, why do you need to know? Why do you want to know that? Uh, there's some areas we work in back art basins, for example, where uh, one plate is spreading away from the other, <clears throat> and, it, and it happens slowly, and these are complicated areas. The young basalt shows up as a black stripe on the seafloor, and you know that's the mid-ocean ridge. That's right. And then the sediment coverage shows where it's older seafloor. So it's a way to get an age map of the seafloor. It's an age map. Oh, okay. So you can actually assign a year or a, a period of time to a given area on the map. We, we can, but to get the ages that we use for plate motion studies, we use another remote sensing technique, which is magnetic anomalies that the Earth's field reverses periodically. Your compass right now points at the North Pole. A million years ago, it would have pointed at the South Pole. Those are the good old days. <laughs> <laughs> and and as, the, as the plates spread apart, seafloor spreading, the asthenosphere comes up and it cools. When it's hot, the magnetic minerals are randomly uh, oriented. But as it cools, those rocks take on the direction of the Earth's field at the time. So right at a mid-ocean ridge today, there's a little vector in the, let's say the Earth's field looks like this. There's a little vector with exactly the same direction. A million years ago, that little vector would have exactly the opposite orientation. So we tow a magnetometer behind the ship and we measure variations in the field. And when it's magnetized in the same direction as the Earth's field, it's a little stronger. The opposite direction of the Earth's field, it's a little weaker. And then we subtract out the theoretical Earth's field. That gives us magnetic anomalies, and those give us the rates of seafloor spreading. Like the rings in a tree. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> a, a, a very good analogy. We're going we're to take a short break now. Uh, this is uh, Richard Hay. Uh, he's a geophysicist and a researcher and professor at uh, HIGP and the School of Ocean Earth Science at UH Manoa. And we're looking at nascent rifting. We're finding out a lot about what goes on in that huge rift in, um, uh, what do you call it, seafloor, seafloor rift near Iceland mm -hmm. and elsewhere. We'll be right back. 
Aloha, my name is Carl Campagna. I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. You can see our show every Wednesday at noon at 12 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com, as well as visiting YouTube and finding the link for the show there. The show is also aired on OC16. We look forward to seeing you on the show. Uh, we have many wonderful guests, uh, including Joan Husted, Corey Rosenley, where we talk about the very important issues of education for our keiki. We look forward to seeing you there. Mahalo. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, and I'm fortunate to be able to host Sustainable Hawaii at thinktechhawaii.com. I hope you'll join in with us every Tuesday from 12 noon to 1 p.m. to see the interesting people we have to share with you their information. Aloha. Okay, we're drilling, we're drilling down. That's what we're doing. Uh, this is uh, Richard Hay. He's a researcher and professor at HIGP in SOWEST. They're looking at nascent rifting. And uh, I guess you've, you've, your current area of interest geographically is the seafloor near Iceland. Mm -hmm. But uh, in, your, in my notes here, you had expeditions uh, and you have looked at or wanted to look at um, rifting, nascent rifting in Surtsey and Vestmanire. I guess say that right. Oh, very good. Vestmanire, I'm listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and in the North American uh, Eurasian seafloor, uh, spreading offshore from the Reykjan Peninsula. Reykjanes. Reykjanes Peninsula. These are all Icelandic words. Yes. <clears throat> They're really hard to pronounce. Oh, yes. <laughs> It's not, nothing, nothing like English, and yet everybody in Iceland speaks English. <laughs> Fortunately for me. <laughs> so where are these places relative to the uh, original uh, seafloor near Iceland? These are all parts of the seafloor? Uh, yes, they're offshore Iceland. The, in southeastern Iceland, where the big ice caps are, that's the shallowest elevation, and uh, the, the people that do seismic tomography say that that's the location of the Iceland hotspot. Some people call it a mantle plume rising from deep in the mantle. Others uh, disagree about that, but we all call it a, a hotspot. And uh, the rifts propagate away from the hotspot, very similar to what we saw in Galapagos and, and many other areas, probably because of the shallow topography. What's the relationship of this formation with the fact that they have a lot of geothermal over there? In well, it's the seafloor spreading that, that causes all of that geothermal activity. The, the plates break apart and the hot material comes up from under the lithosphere and it's, it's hot, so the Icelanders take advantage of that for geothermal energy. So it's a special energy. place for, from, from yeah. both points of view. Uh -huh. It's really the same thing, I suppose. Yeah. So, um, so you're mapping this whole area there, um, and it's going to teach you, it is teaching you, about how these rifts work, nascent rifts work, mm -hmm. anywhere they might be. That's right. What, what has it taught you so far? Well, uh, this work has actually had some practical applications. Can we go back to the graphic? Back to for the a graphic, minute? yeah. Because, Very important. because on, although Iceland's a pretty large scale mm -hmm. with these uh, microplates, on the very largest scale, this is how continents break apart. So, for example, at the southern tip of Africa or South America, mm -hmm. the rifting started about 125 million years ago. That rifting slowly propagated to the north until it hit that bend in the coastlines near the equator about a hundred million years ago. So it took 25 million years for that rifting to, to get all the way up there. This is the rifting between Africa and South America? That's right. It's propagating rifting. The same thing I found in Galapagos, same thing near Easter Island, same thing this in is Iceland. Serious business, this though. is how continents this break is, apart. This is huge. I mean, yeah. we, we've heard this before, but you're talking about the, the precise uh, you know, process by which the continents have broken apart. That's right. And they break apart by propagating rifting. And if you remember back to that Galapagos work, as one rift propagates, you get a failed rift on one side of the axis. And so the, the propagating rifting, even that breaks continents apart, produces failed rifts. And these are important because these are sites of uh, mineral and hydrocarbon deposits. What's a failed rift exactly? A failed rift is, it used to be a seafloor spreading center, but it stopped spreading because it got replaced by a propagating rift uh, off to one side. So what does it look like? I mean, how do I know it's a failed rift? Usually they're gro grobbins, uh, troughs in the seafloor, fault-bounded troughs are, are, are what grobbins are. 
And in there, because these are near continental margins, they, there's uh, organic material, there's sediments, rivers carry sediments in, there's often uh, some kind of a, a reef that forms a capping uh, a rock, and so you get massive sulfide deposits, copper, uh, zinc, or you get oil and gas deposits. And so the, what we're learning about plate tectonics helps guide resource exploration. Well, that, that converts into money, doesn't it? Yeah. If I want a certain kind of chemical, and I know that in a failed rift there's going to have a lot of this kind of chemical or whatever material I'm looking for, mm -hmm. then you can show me where that might be and I could go and mine it. When I was younger, I did consulting work for oil and, and mining companies. There's a concept from Buckminster Fuller, I'm sure you've heard of it, Spaceship Earth, yeah. that if oh, yeah. we were on a spaceship, we'd, we'd want to take care of our spaceship, we'd want to know about the resources on it, how much food do we have, how much fuel do we have. And he said, you know, think of Earth the same way. We're on a trip through space on Earth, it's all we've got. We better take care of it, we better understand what resources are available to us. Yeah. Yeah. But this can help us find those resources. That's right. Yeah. And I mean, oil, you mentioned oil. I mean, is, is this help you find oil? Uh, on a large scale, yes. Uh, and, it, and it does it in the following way. That if, let's say, this is South America and this is Africa, and you find oil in a failed rift on one continental margin, it used to be you'd think the best place to look would be exactly on the other margin. Uh, and we, we, know, the graphic yeah, we, we know that from the, from the graphics that uh, th this is actually, uh, I'm not sure you're going to be able to see it, but where South America and Africa spread apart yeah. away from the mid-ocean ridge, away from the transform faults, I guess I haven't defined yet, but there are things called fracture zones that show exactly where Africa fit together with South America. So they're called conjugate margin, margins, where, where Africa fit against South America, mm -hmm. exactly where they fit together. Those are conjugate like pieces margins. In a puzzle. That's right. So you used to think that if you find uh, oil or, or uh, minerals on, on one flank, the best place to look would be the conjugate That's margin on think. the other side. But if this forms by propagating rifting, those failed rifts are only on one flank of the, of the ridge axis. So the very worst place to look is on the conjugate margin. Because if you find it on South America in a failed rift, you won't find it in Africa. That's right. Yeah. This is really back to the, the graphic one more time. Um, this really, uh, what what was the world like? Uh, what did you say? Uh, Twenty-five million years ago? Uh, One hundred and twenty-five million, 125 million years, years ago, South America and Africa hadn't started to break apart yet. Yeah. Two hundred million years ago, there was no Atlantic Ocean that. Africa and South America fit together, Africa and North America fit together, Eurasia f fit together with uh, uh, Greenland, Greenland fit together with North America. There was no Atlantic Ocean. But there was a big Pacific. Pacific was bigger. So as the Atlantic gets bigger, slowly, the Pacific gets smaller huh. until eventually, as the Atlantic gets bigger, the North America and South America and Africa and Eurasia are going and they Maybe they go all the way around the Earth if nothing happens to stop. They hit, they collide, that stops the plate motions. Yeah. Then eventually that warms up and the rifting starts there and it comes back uh, again here. These giant cycles that take yeah. hundreds of millions of years. What are those arrows on the, uh, on the graphic? Those, those are, are the, these red arrows. Yeah, right? those are the directions of plate motion. We get the rates from magnetic anomalies. We get the directions from transform faults. And there's three kinds of plate motion, so there's three kinds of plate boundaries. Plates can move apart. That's the mid-ocean ridges that, that I study. Plates can move toward each other, and if there's two continents on those plates, you get these big compressive mountains and where uh, India runs into Asia. That, that's how you form the Himalayas or the Alps, where mm -hmm. Africa runs into Eurasia. So when I see the red arrows, arrows pointing to each other. That's that, compression. That's compression. When they point away, that's, that's extension. So it looks like, for example, in the Pacific, it looks like they're pointing away from each other. That's right. And that's, that's the mid-ocean ridge, where those, where those vectors point away from each other. That's the East Pacific rise. That's the fastest spreading mid-ocean ridge on, on Earth. It's maybe why we get microplates near Easter Island. Yeah. And in the Atlantic, I can't, I can't tell it's, very well. It's but. slowly spreading, and those, those arrows are relative to the hot spots. Mm -hmm. So if you find Hawaii on that map, you'll see the red arrows go right along Hawaii. 
North America, the arrows are kind of slow and pointing a little bit toward the Pacific. The third type of plate boundary is where plates slide past each other, and that's the San Andreas as a transform fault. And so to get the San Andreas motion, you, you say both of those arrows are relative to the hot spot, so you take the Pacific vector, and the tail is where the hot spot is. You take the North American vector, put the tail at the hot spot, and then you do vector subtraction to find the relative plate motion. This is what we call absolute plate motion. This is relative to the hot spots. Relative plate motion is just relative to another plate. So on this map, if, if, the, if the arrow is long, some arrows are long and some arrows are short. That's what, right. What's the difference? The, fast, the, the longer the arrow, the faster the plate motion. So you'll see that there's, a, there's some patterns there, that the longest arrows tend to be the oceanic plates. Yes. Because there, their plates are colliding, but one plate can go, can go down, and that can go much faster. That's subduction. That's how you get the big tsunami-generating earthquakes, and there's a little, they stick. They don't, they don't slip and they, they stick and stick, the strain builds up, and then the, an earthquake happens, There's and all violent. that water goes up and comes yeah. away. But because the oceanic plate can go down, that seems to be the driving mechanism of plate tectonics. So the fast plates today are the oceanic plates. Um, and um, what about, I mean, what areas in the world have more plate action, tectonic action, than others? I mean, there must be some areas where things are moving faster and you find more action, and other, other parts of the world where it's, it's less action? How does that work the, the, out? The ring of fire. The fastest plates are in the, in the Pacific Ocean Basin. The yeah. Pacific plate is moving fast toward the trenches like the Japan Trench and yeah. the Tonga Trench and the Marianas Trench. Yeah. In the East Pacific, uh, the Nazca plate is moving fast towards South America. The Cocos Plate is moving fast toward Central America, all, the, all of these trenches. The Aleutians, the whole thing is a trench that the Pacific Plate is subducting. Yeah. But now you, there are plates over North America, the, uh, the short, short arrows there. Yeah. I guess that's not nearly the same level of activity as under the ocean. That's right. The, the continental plates are moving slowly, and when I was a student, we used to think that was because the continents were much thicker than oceans. That's one reason that, that we like to work in the oceans, because the, the oceanic plates are thinner and, tell you more, more. and more rigid, so they're easier to understand. The, we, so we used to think the continents are, are thick and, and weak, and so they can't move fast because they've got to go through the mantle, right? There's mantle drag. But, but now we think they're carried by the mantle, and the reason that they're, uh, they're moving slowly is they don't have subduction zones attached today. And the reason that's what we think is the Indian plate that has India and Australia on it is moving fast, even though they're India and Australia are continents. And that's because there are trenches to the north. Australia is uh, moving to the north toward trenches. There was a trench north of India. That's why it moved so fast toward Asia. And when it hit Asia, it started slowing down. But there's a lot of uh, momentum still there. So even though that trench no longer exists, that whole plate continues to move rapidly. Okay. And the these north. are the kinds of conclusions that you would draw from the data, for example, That's right. that you're getting from Iceland. You would be able to extend, you know, ex extrapolate that data somehow and use that to determine all the arrows we've seen and all the, uh, all the structures we've seen here on this map. Well, we'd, we'd use the work we're doing to get the, those arrows near Iceland to get the other er areas. You'd have to do the same kind of work, but okay. in other parts of the world. But does Iceland teach us, for example, by some kind of a parallel examination, what happens under the water yes. elsewhere, like in the Pacific. Yes, because you can, you can ground truth it. When you're doing remote sensing, you're always kind of wondering, am I really understanding it well? Because you're a couple of miles up and the seafloor is down here, and you're never quite sure. But on Iceland, you can actually go out and hit rocks with a hammer and know exactly where you're collecting and samples. Those lessons are useful everywhere, That's especially right. where you can't see it clearly. That's right. So Iceland is one of the great natural laboratories on Earth to understand seafloor spreading. Are you the only one working oh, in Iceland? No, no. Uh, hundreds of us uh, or right? more. You get to meet Iceland. them there. Uh, yeah, sure. You have conferences, whatnot. Yeah, yeah. 
in, in Reykjavik. Where Reykjavik, yeah. Reykjavik, that's yeah. right. <laughs> wonderful place. I encourage all of I've your viewers only good to go there. About Reykjavik. It's a, it's a wonder. <laughs> Iceland is just a wonderful, uh, spectacular place. So, do you recommend this to people and kids to go and do this kind of geology? Sure. If you're up for adventure and travel, and you think it's important to understand the Earth, this is a good field to work in. Yeah, and, and gee whiz, you know, you could you could spend mm, 125 million years learning about this. <laughs> We're only beginning. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Richard. Oh, thank, Richard thank, Hay, thank you very professor much. Professor and uh, researcher at uh, HIGP in SOAS at UH Manoa, looking with me at a closer look in nascent rifting in Iceland and elsewhere. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on the show. Aloha. YouTube the same.